Hello, this is Dr. Marty Harris. This lecture is entitled Human Exceptionalities and Historical Overview. To understand the future of special education, we must understand that this field has been shaped by societal, political, and philosophical perspectives. It has been said that a society can be judged by how it has treated individuals who are different. Throughout history, there are both positive and negative examples of how a society has treated people who were different. The purposes of this lecture are threefold. One, to provide an overview of how societies have treated people with exceptionalities. Two, to examine the influences that have shaped perspectives towards people with exceptionalities, and three, to explore the changing paradigms about exceptionalities across time. It is not within the realm of this lecture to present a comprehensive history in the field of disabilities and special education, but you are encouraged to learn more through the history sections presented at the beginning of each chapter in our wonderful textbook. How did categorizing people start? Categorizing and labeling people is not new. Tribes, villages, and ancient civilizations have labeled people for centuries. Plato and Aristotle were among the earliest educators who used labeling and categorization to determine who should be educated. In fact, these philosophers were trying to identify gifted minds to attend their school. And just as today, they debated the definitions of giftedness and intelligence. Plato thought it was deductive reasoning, while Aristotle argued it was inductive reasoning. But let's travel back to even earlier times. In early time periods, treatment of people who were different was influenced by survival instincts, superstition, and lack of knowledge. Generally speaking, people who were born different or who had acquired a disability were neglected, mistreated, or eliminated. In primitive and ancient times, the weak were left to die. Infants who were deformed were not fed, so they would die. Adults who had mental or emotional problems had the demons pounded out of their heads with a sharp rock. The Greeks, who valued the perfect body and mind, routinely left anyone who deviated from the norm in the mountains for the wolves. The Romans used the river method to eliminate babies who were born different. But with the Roman Empire came a change because several of the Caesars were exceptional. Julius Caesar was a gifted writer, orator, and military leader. Four other Caesars had disabilities including emotional disturbance, hearing impairment, stuttering, and epilepsy. In fact, the word seizure actually evolved from the word Caesar. So leaders had disabilities and a new trend evolved to respond to a disability by hiding it. During the Middle Ages, people with disabilities began to survive more often and so they became objects of ridicule, pity, and fear. Think of the hunchback of Notre Dame, court jesters, and beggars who were mutilated to become more effective beggars. In the Middle Ages, if you talked to yourself or had odd behaviors, it was assumed that you were possessed by the devil and must be a witch. Therefore, you must be burned or drowned. Thus, religious beliefs 
we're beginning to enter into the explanation of deviating from the norm. The basis of these reactions were survival, fear, and superstition. Because we did not have a legitimate knowledge base to identify the cause of a disability, we try to explain a disability through superstition or a religious explanation. It is human nature to fear what one doesn't understand. This paradigm is still present. Consider the 1980s when AIDS first came to the USA. We were afraid to drink out of water fountains, use public restrooms, or swimming pools. Sadly, one child's home was burnt to the ground because he had AIDS that he had acquired from a blood transfusion for his hemophilia. It is also true that some parents protected and cared for their disabled children. Some tribes or societies honored and respected people who were born different. These groups believed that such a child was a gift from God. As we move into the French Enlightenment period, some new philosophies and ideas changed how people thought about learning and people with disabilities. John Locke, a physician, humanist, and philosopher, brought us to an understanding of the mind, proposed that people understand everything through observation or empirical study. And he introduced the concept of tabula rosa. All of his ideas changed the way we thought about learning and schooling. Tabula rosa meant that an infant is a blank slate on which is written all the experiences of the senses. Simple ideas come from experience and complex ideas are built from simple notions by the operations of the mind, although all of it is rooted in experience. Rousseau, a philosopher and educator, agreed with the concept of tabula rosa. He introduced the concept of sensationalist. He theorized that we learn through our senses, not that all we are is innate, stamped upon us at birth, which was the current thinking. Rousseau suggested education for the blind could be accomplished with raised print and developed a theory of pedagogy. Pedagogy meaning the art and science of teaching. Diderot was an extremely popular and gifted man in the royal courts. He sought to bring all knowledge of the world together, arranged alphabetically, to make it accessible to all. In other words, the first encyclopedia. Wouldn't he be amazed that today's knowledge doubles every year and can be put on a DVD? Anyhow, Diderot was a very prominent and revered person in his time, and so when he advocated for education of the deaf, the blind, and the deaf-blind, Queen Marie Antoinette's court listened, and they established a school for the deaf and blind in Paris. Now, France was not the only place where new ideas about disabilities were emerging. In the 1500s, Pedro Ponce, a Spanish monk, taught the deaf to read, write, and speak, but he would not share his techniques, nor did he record them for future use. In the 1600s, Holden and Wallace began deaf education in England. Institutions Although there were advances in thinking about learning and about people with disabilities, during the 1500s, institutions were designed to keep different people away from the world of normal people. The conditions were horrible, cold and wet, dirty, rotten food, full of pestilence and disease. All types and all ages were thrown together such as the insane, 
mentally retarded, and dissenters or heretics. There were separate institutions for men and women. Men frequently had their wives declared insane and institutionalized because divorce was not acceptable. Treatments were harsh and remedies violent. At the time, it was believed that the mentally ill could not feel pain, and the only way to cure them was to deliver harsh treatments such as beatings or being hosed down with cold water so they'd feel the pain. On the brighter side of institutionalization, there were religious organizations that believed in custodial care. In their facilities, residents received better, although still, basic care. Physicians and Medical Science, the 1700s and 1800s. In the 1700s, society became interested in knowledge and order. This was the time when scientists developed classification systems for plants and animals. Physicians began to apply the classification systems to illnesses. Dr. Philippe Pinel, a physician, applied the philosophies of the French Enlightenment and classification of illnesses to mental illness. He argued that mental illness was a disease, not a crime. He advocated for humane treatment of people with mental illness and for providing these people with a quality of life as close to normal as possible. At the time, such ideas were revolutionary. Additionally, physicians began to think of mental retardation differently. Three classification terms were proposed for mild, moderate, and severe mental retardation. They were idiot, imbecile, and moron. Although in today's world these words are used as common insults, particularly when we're driving, at the time they were first used, it was a major step forward. Special Education Beginnings Jean Marc Guitard was a French physician and educator at an institution for the deaf. Outside of Paris, three hunters captured a young boy. He was naked, walked on all fours like an animal, had no language, and did not relate to humans at all. Initially, the child was placed in a freak show. Then he escaped, and he was recaptured. Finally, the wild boy of Averon was brought to Dr. Etard, who believed that idiocy could be treated. Idiocy was the word for mental retardation. Even Etard's colleague, Dr. Pinnell, warned him not to waste his time on this hopeless idiot. After five years of intensive training, young Victor could walk, talk, read a few words, and use some social skills. But Atar thought he was a failure because Victor could not generalize his learning to other situations. Fortunately, the scientist in Atar led him to record all of his work, and the French Academy of Sciences encouraged him to publish his memoirs, which became the first written documentation about special education. His work included an educational intervention based on individualized approach, sensory stimulation, and systematic intervention. These principles became the heart of special education, and Attar is considered to be the father of special education. Although Attar was disappointed in his work, his protege, Edward Seguin, saw the value of Attar's methods and brought them to the U.S., where he established the first school for individuals with mental retardation. In the early 19th century, things began to change even more. In the USA, Samuel Gridley Howe 
established the Perkins School for the Blind. It is still a major education and research center addressing visual impairments. Additionally, Howe established a school for children with mental retardation in Massachusetts. Being an advanced thinker and a reformer, he approached the state government for funding, arguing that it would benefit the state to have these children taken care of. Massachusetts agreed, and therefore the first state-funded special education school was established. Thomas Hopkins Gallaudet was asked to work with Alice Coswell, a four-year-old who was deaf. Her father sent Gallaudet to Europe to study methodologies for the deaf. Gallaudet rejected the English oral method and brought back the French sign language method. It is interesting to note that the debate about these two methodologies continues today. Thomas Hopkins Gallaudet and his family continued to advocate for the deaf by establishing the Connecticut Asylum in Hartford for the deaf and later the first residential school for the deaf followed by the first church for the deaf in New York City. The first college for the deaf people was established in Washington DC and named in honor of Thomas Hopkins Gallaudet. This university is a major force for the deaf community today. Visit their website and be amazed. Dr. Maria Montessori, the first woman physician in Italy, believed that early intervention based on concrete experiences was essential. She developed her methodologies working with poor children who were at risk for failure. Her methods are still used today in Head Start, preschools, general education, and special education. Another lasting influence in the area of special education is the work of Lewis Braille. You probably know what Braille is, but do you know the story behind it? Louis Braille was a French child who, at the age of three, was playing in his father's leather shop. This inquisitive child managed to poke his eye with one of his father's tools. That eye became infected, and in the world without antibiotics, the infection spread to the other eye and left him blind. Louis was sent to the Paris School for the Blind, at the age of 10, he excelled in science and music. There, blind students were encouraged to use the military night code, which was a series of raised dots. At the age of 15, Lewis decided to improve that code, and we are still using it today. As a gifted organist and musician, he played in the cathedrals of France and became an instructor at the National Institute for the Blind in France. There is much more to our history of special education and disabilities, but now we must move on to the new millennium with new perspectives and new paradigms. Take time to read through this chart, Changes Over Time. Think about the trends and the paradigms. In other modules, we will cover more of the history, particularly when we address the law and current special education practices. All of our history leads us to a new paradigm. Education should be special. Thanks for listening.